books from our fabulous readers. So I'm Ellen Austin Lee. I'm an alum of the LaSalle University Solstice MFA in Creative Writing Program. So welcome to our winter 2023 evening reading series with today's edition featuring Solstice alum and current grad assistant, Cassie Rubico, our Solstice journal. Oh. <laughs> our solstice director, Meg Harney. We fiction in writing for young people faculty member, Laura Williams McCaffrey. So as we open this physical and virtual space, I would like to acknowledge that the territory on which the LaSalle University stands is that of the Clock Pocket and the Massachusetts people. LaSalle's campus is a place to honor and respect the history of the native and indigenous communities who continue to reside in the area currently known as Massachusetts and the continued efforts of their community leaders to ensure that history is not oversimplified or lost. This statement is one small step in acknowledging the difficult history that brought us to reside on this land and help us seek understanding of our place within that history. Ownership of land is itself a colonial concept. And we acknowledge that the ideal restorative measure is to return land to native and indigenous communities. The Solstice MFA program at Cell University seeks ways to be part of a better future going forward. As we grow, we pledge to seek out native writers for our faculty and guest faculty. And meanwhile, we have established the Dubois Fellowship for Native and Indigenous Writers, which will be granted to an incoming Solstice student annually. We hope to inspire others to take action as well. One way you might do so is to consider a gift to the Native Land Conservancy based in the area currently known as Bashkee, Massachusetts. More information can be found at www.nativelandconservancy.org. So first up tonight, we will have uh, Cassie Rubigo, who will be introduced by Block. And then we'll have Meg Carney, who will be introduced by Molly and Vegan. And finally, we'll have Laura Williams McCaffrey, who will be introduced by Amy Hoffman. So I'm Ellen Austin Lee again, as you forgot. <laughs> and I'm a uh, 2022 grad, so just a year ago of the Solstice MFA program in poetry. I'm honored to introduce a fellow alum and also a fellow grad assistant for this residency, Cassie Rubico. Cassie has served as a grad assistant for many winter residencies at Solstice and those who've met her know why. Her positive energy is, well, positively infectious. When I attended my first solstice residency in 2020 as a student, my anxiety level was as high as my exam. Well, Cassie handed me my welcome packet, her warmth and kindness immediately put me in ease. Speaking of warmth, how many people do you know who have a charming electric fireplace in their dorm room? <laughs> um, similarly, Cassie's writing welcomes us into the world of her words. Cassie Kubico is an essayist currently working on a memoir. Her work has appeared in Chicken Soup for the Soul, Guide to Culture Creative Journal, Insight Academic Journal, Parnassus Literary Journal, the Anthology River News, Tales of Lowell in the Merrimack Valley, and Tosca Literary Magazine. She has been a guest columnist for the Lowell Sun and a freelance writer for Cool Running Duck. She received a Master's of Art in Creative Writing, Literature, and Graveyard College, and an MFA in Creative Writing at Solstice when we were behind it. She has taught writing in various in, and literature at various colleges and is currently teaching in the Changing Lives Through Literature program. Please help me to welcome to the stage, Cassie Verdita. Oh. 
time. That was very nice. Very nice. Thank you, Meg and Quentin, for once again welcoming me. That is gratification. It's always so wonderful to be around all you inspiring people, and I'm honored every time I come. So thank you, Meg and Quentin, and everyone else. So I'm gonna I'm gonna read an essay or a chapter actually of my um, memoir in progress. Uh, I'm, I'm writing about uh, growing up the youngest in a large family with limited means, and this is an, a chapter that comes toward the end. It's, I write a lot about my mother. She appears a lot in the memoir because she's the matriarch, and she's getting to a point where. That role is becoming more difficult. So this is, I guess, all I have to say. <laughs> Playing solitaire. This is not my mother's eulogy. She's not dead. In fact, today she tells me in a very lively voice to put the two on the three. She tells me this four times before I tell her that I can't because both the two and the three are red. They are, she asks, leaning forward to look over the table without getting up from her automatic recliner. Oh, yes, she sits back. I play solitaire while visiting my mother because the game allows me to stay still for a few hours a week and listen to her try to talk, which is all she wants from me these days, to listen. At 94 years old, mom fights to find the words that will help her remember the life she has lived. The life that has brought her here, forgetting the names of the people she loved and the dinner she ate an hour before. My mother has not been diagnosed, but we, my five, five siblings and I, speculate dementia, Alzheimer's, old age. She dismisses the idea when we suggest seeing a doctor and pity the person who mentions medication. Mom prides herself on her over-the-counter mode of sur survival. She proudly displays vitamins for this, bare aspirin for that, in a family-sized container of Tums. Pills for high blood pressure, however, disappear soon after they are prescribed. What do I need them for? She asks the same question in regard to the home health aides who were assigned after her short hospital stay. We try to explain the risks of living alone, but she interrupts. I have the right to make my own decision. So we let her. Sometimes I can figure out the words to fill in the blanks for mom. Most times I have absolutely no idea what she's trying to say. One thing she is clear about, she wants to die. Before solitaire, but after the pandemic, mom and I played bingo. We did this via conference call on speakerphone through the senior center. She had set up TV tables in her studio apartment, each one holding two bingo cards, six graham crackers, topped with peanut butter, four bite-sized chocolate bars, and a bottle of seltzer with cranberry juice. I'd rush in after a two-hour commute from where I live in Vermont, just in time to hear the first number call through mom's phone. You're late, she'd snap. But halfway through the first game, we'd settle into the excitement of covering squares in the comfort of each other's company without having to talk. When one of us got lucky, mom would bounce up in her seat, fumble for the mute button, screaming into the receiver, bingo, bingo, bingo. The one time I won the cover all the $8 jackpot, mom got so excited that instead of pressing mute, she pressed end. By the time she figured out her mistake and how to call back, the game was long over. She tried to convince the woman on the other end that her daughter, you know the one, the, the youngest, number seven, my baby, had won the game, fair and square, but to no avail. My eight dollar winnings went elsewhere. Soon after that, we stopped playing bingo. One day I got to mom's house and the tables weren't set up. When I asked why, she waved her hand above her head, mumbling something about someone not doing things the right way. Then she brought out the grain crackers, peanut butter, and milky ways. Before bingo, but after mom gave up her driver's license, thankfully this she did willingly at age 87 after a mishap in a busy parking lot, I'd pick mom up once a week and would have lunch at her favorite restaurant and then shop at Sam's. We'd start by splitting a pizza and Greek salad and talk mostly about her 
seniors, the people she had taken care of, most of whom were younger than she. Inevitably, someone from the senior center where mom worked for 30 years would stop by the table to say hello to mom and tell me how much she had helped them. After lunch, I'd follow mom around Sam's Club for an hour or two, where she'd buy in bulk for one, tossing 48 rolls of toilet paper and four cases of water into her car. Into her car. On the way home, she'd insist on stopping to gas, whether I needed it or not, so she could pump and pay. Then I'd pull around to the back of mom's apartment building. Don't get out, she'd insist, loading her bags into the cart to wheel up to her second floor apartment. Watching my mother from inside my car, maneuver through the double doors and down the hallway. I didn't think of her as being old. Since mom's hospital stayed six months ago, she spends most of the day in her recliner, reminding me that she's ready. Ready for what, I joke. I know exactly what she means, but I'm not ready to talk about death with my mother. I think about it daily, what life would be like without her. When she gets her wish, closes her eyes one night, and that's that. I imagine this not because my mother's wish was my wish too, but as a way to prepare or maybe protect from the pain when it happens. I think about what it would like, what it would be like not to call mom every night after dinner and listen to her try to explain to me what she's watching. You know the show, the one with the guy, the guy who died? Jeopardy, I tell her. But these aren't the ones with that guy, the one, you know, the one who was on for a long time. You know the guy? Alex Trebek. That's right, she says. I imagine the proud look on mom's face as she settles back into her seat, having conveyed the right clues once again. I then listen to her start and stop sentences for 15 minutes more, and then we say goodnight. Love you, she says. I love you too. Today at mom's, my partner P sleeps next, next to me while I play solitaire. Her studio apartment is his favorite place to nap. Is he okay, mom asks? Not in a whisper, every few minutes. Between mom's asking and the price is right on high volume, she refuses to wear hearing aids. It's amazing he can sleep at all, but he does because it's comfortable in here. Comfortable and clean. Her closet still categorized by color. With Pete sleeping and mom trying to make sense of Monty Hall, I slip out to the hallway to take a call from work for work. This irritates my mother, I know, but it's a waste of time to try to explain that I have to work and that I also want to see her and that it's not always convenient for me to drive four hours round trip to do so. I also know that not having to make the trip will mean something worse. On the ride home, P will recount their conversation while he's in the hallway. How my mother told him about her father, the grandfather I never met and knew nothing about until I was well into adulthood. Mom did all she could to protect her kids from the stuff, the stuff she had to suffer. She was on her own at 16, P will say. I know this, but never thought much about it until my own daughters turned that age. And I realized they were still children. It's hard for me to think of my mother as anything but the woman who figured out how to feed a family of nine on next to nothing. She'll also tell P about Kevin, the child she lost when he was 20. Some days my mother shows me her prayer cards. Sometimes we say the Lord's Prayer together. And always she kisses the cards and says, love you to both my brother and father, her hubby of 40 years who passed over 25 years ago. I'm ready to see them again, she reminds me. When I was 13, the age mom was when her own mother died, she told me that her only wish was to live long enough for her kids to reach adulthood. Her youngest, me, turned 60 this year. Do you want anything? Mom asks for the 11th time since we've been there. Yes, mom, I want something. I want to go back two years to when you were driving me crazy from the passenger seat, pointing out the speed limit and telling me to turn left half a mile before I needed to. Or better yet, five years to when you drove yourself to all weekly meetups. What do I want? I want you to use your walker so I don't have to worry about you lying on the floor for two days until someone finds you. I don't say any of this because I know it will only hurt her. 
What I really want is patience. I want to not get frustrated when I have to tell you something five times, then have to tell her again five minutes later. Patience is what I want because someday, sooner than I am ready, no matter how much I try to prepare myself or plan for it, this will be her eulogy. Peace stirs. Monty Hall makes a deal with a man wearing a spaghetti strainer on his head, and I continue flipping cards. We're good, Mom, I say. We're good. Thank you. Um, my name is Colleen. Um, I'm a current Solstice student, um, and I somehow got the honor to introduce our director. Um, <laughs> so um, I just wanted to start this off with just a little um, little story. Um, in case you didn't know, Meg's the director of the program, which I think is pretty cool. Um, and when she called me and told me that I got accepted into the program, I didn't answer the phone call because I was at work. Um, instead, I listened to the voicemail and cried in the middle of the office building that I got into the program. <laughs> um, so my first highlight of night was crying. Um, <laughs> good tears, obviously. Um, but I can't thank her enough for uh, what she's done for me in this program. Um, she's taken the time over and over again to make everyone feel safe and secure and able to express themselves creatively. Plus she's let me cry in her office. So it's it's been pretty great. Meg Carney is the author of several poetry books, including The Unkindness and Unkindness of Ravens and Home by Now, which was the winner of the Penn New England LL Winship Award. She's also written The Ice Storm, which was published as a chapbook in 2020. Meg's poetry has also been featured in American Life and Poetry, as well as a writer's almanac, and was included in the 2017 Best American Poetry Anthology. She's written novels for teens, including When You Never Said Goodbye, The Secret of Me, The Girl in the Mirror, and Sudden Flash Youth, 65 short stories. Her picture book, Trooper, was the winner of the 2015 Kentucky Bluegrass Award and the Missouri Association of School Librarians Show Me Readers Award, among several others. In the spring of 2021, Meg's poems, All the Morning Crows, was published in the World Word Works Press and was also the winner of the 2020 Washington Prize for Poetry, um, which made Small Press Distribution Poetry Bestseller List and was nominated for a Pushcart Prize and was awarded the Silver, Me the Silver Medal in Forward Reviews and Music Book Award for Poetry. Not only is Meg a wonderful poet and writer, but she is a kind, passionate person who is unafraid to share her love of all things reading, writing, and solstice. I'm so grateful to have the opportunity to say that I know her, um, and I know anyone who's had the chance to get to know you feels the same way. It's my pleasure to introduce our fearless leader, Meg Carney. Thank you so much for that, Colleen. I forgot that you cried in my office. You're not the first. <laughs> Thank you for that very thoughtful introduction. And what a, a pleasure it is to read with Cassie and Laura tonight. Um, and, and as most of you know, there's no better place to read than uh, at Solstice. Now, under our Waffle fries. Yeah. You're in the Arno Lounge at the Cell University. Uh, I'm going to read from the Ice Storm tonight. I realized this book came out in September 2020, in the midst of the pandemic. Um, I read from it a few times on, on virtual readings. I feel like after that, I kind of have neglected it. Um, so, the Ice Storm, um, this beautiful chat book uh, put up by Greenland and Press, is a heroic crown of sonnets. So, in a heroic crown, we have 15 
interconnected sonnets. In sonnets one through 14, the last line of sonnet one becomes the first line of sonnet two. The last line of sonnet two becomes the first line of sonnet three and so on. And then sonnet number 15 is comprised of the first lines of sonnets one through 14. It's like a big mind bending puzzle. Um, and I'm, I won't have time to read the whole thing. I think I'll probably have time to read maybe the, the first 13 or so. So, and each, um, each sonnet has its own separate title. Rain. The marriage is over before the storm strikes. He won't leave without a court decree and a shitload more convincing that she won't change her mind. Silence, not so much their fights, divides the house. She, accustomed to flight, has taken the mountain views upstairs. He is down in the guest room but could be in the master bed if inclined to insist on his rights. He is, after all, still, she is, after all, still his wife, another 31 days she's been counting. He fingers his guitar, wonders how love can die so quietly, drained like air from a pinprick in a tire. They're aware such a wound doesn't burst open as if shot by a gun. It starts like a lullaby, innocent as rain. Lullaby. It starts like a lullaby, innocent as rain, like a song they both hum, avoiding the words. It lies like a baby they dare not disturb, a being they birthed but hesitate to name. Melody, carol, aria, ditty, refrain, hurricane, gale, tempest, blizzard, all spells with no elixir, all curses overheard. They be inept as parents. That is plain. Children, he said, tell me if that door is closed. She held up forefinger and thumb, pressed them together. Now he's more relieved than she. Explain, she screams, why you won't admit I've known better. Now there's nothing but dye in the rose, in the forecast. Nothing but rain. Statue. So this is a flashback to their apartment in Manhattan. In the forecast, nothing but rain the first time she considers leaving. Just days after they stood on the roof, disbelieving how downtown burned. Who could fly a plane into 3,000 lives? Not a train was running, no cabs, buses, no one leaving the island, no traffic overhead, their landline receiving calls so they couldn't dial out. The main thing she needed besides a drink was company, but he'd taken off on his bike down First Avenue, then west, then south again to see what he might. South still smoke. Below the window, a statue in her little park resembles her husband, happy, but nothing's what it seems at the edges of twilight. Prenuptials. Nothing is what it seems at the edges of twilight. The bride might be a sleepwalker, the groom, a wish. The rings seem tarnished, 
The Val could use a stitch. She's pale, yet has no business wearing white. She's thought of pulling it off and still might, but he mouths, he, he says the magic words, then mouths don't swish. Another prize he later writes to claim and relish. One might think Titanic and be right. Bid bon voyage to this Jack and Jill as they ignore the ice infested waters. If they pop the champagne, get quite stoned, they can pretend they're not strangers, each clueless of where the ship is bound until anger's hand clears the deck, yanks out the lights. Best not to talk about it. So the new gets left. Anger's hand clears the deck, yanks out the lights. She books a flight to France alone. Alone in Provence, she watches the sun set over the dome of Cezanne's mountain. She starts to fathom his obsession, how in its hourly newness. Victoire could inspire a life's work, a tome grown, a tome grown out of trying to get it right, bone of rock, light spilling soft as a brush across the canvas. Back home, it's so hot, even the spoons are warm to the touch. When she calls, it's plain, they'll avoid difficult subjects. They form a pact of silence. There's an illusion to maintain, though her flight runs against the norm. He thinks we'll always have the weather to blame. All that remains. He thinks we'll always have the weather to blame as night cracks its knuckles, fuses light, then blow. He hasn't seen this coming or didn't want to know. Now home is a war zone, woods, that obsessive terrain, strewn with limbs, downed dreams. The ugly refrain, you fool, you fool, the wind taps on the window. He stops her on the stair. Where did my wife go? She slips off her ring. Here's what remains. They'll be 11 days without power, but they don't know that yet. She retreats to bed, that refuge, wonders what the dog senses coming, thunder, crash of trees, the chasm widening to swallow half the house. Yet she thinks it's just the world imploding again. Ice. She thinks it's just the world imploding again as she studies shadows of candle throws on the ceiling. Silent but jittery as crows around a carcass. What foul fare she'd eaten as she cooked and cleaned and he dug dandelions, cut paths through the woods lay stones and rows and peed on trees so all the world would know there it is. She guzzled screams, chased them with gin. All night the forest falls. She thought they'd be safe in the country, but it had been the city that saved them those early years, that little nest 12 flights up to the view of the towers, creme de la creme now lost, a point that sharpens as if on a lathe. By morning, the world outside her window is ice. The new world. By morning, the world outside her window is ice. Beyond the front door lies a kind of Oz, Tree limbs and power lines entwined like lovers. 
old oaks and maples and cased in glass. They've weathered tougher storms. Each blade of grass, a rough hewn jewel that cuts like the finest diamond when the dog ventures out behind the house. Next time he'll think twice and go in the driveway instead. Though he'll follow each of them with their buckets down to the stream, its surface veiled by snow and ice, it's their only source of water now. They bicker and snap. The dog senses their sorrow. They call a fragile peace around the wood stone. Power outage. They call a fragile peace around the wood stove, like rival armies on opposite sides of a river. As long as silence abides, they contend what's they contend what's died inside them. Trove of once treasured songs that linked and drove each to think it right they spend their lives together. One messed up fantasy collides with another. So much for true love in the face of natural disasters. I can carry my own bucket, she insists, rising from the fire at the words, I won't, you never, and neither can resist money, money, and more than I can stand. Don't say mine, don't touch, don't. Adrenaline. Don't say love. Don't touch. Don't bother calling the power company, he says. Everyone's basement is flooding, but she is stubborn and waits in queue, though they won't come any sooner, even when she lies. Can't you understand? My husband is sick. He packs a bag, leaves town for a party. Just once, couldn't he be blunt and say, fuck you? They've been, there'd been a story in the paper. A girl lifted the front end of a car to save a dog. A 12th grader, she marvels. She lets out a grunt, hauling up the dead sump pump battery. Thinks, you can handle this house by yourself. Doubt is proven to be ignorance when he asks for, thank God the neighbors have a generator. Think you can handle this house by yourself? Think you can keep the ice dam from damming, from spreading its yellow fan across the ceiling? Stop those nasty Welsh boys from smashing the mailbox, catch the elf who leaves dead robins stuffed in soup cans on the front porch. Talk trash to the man at the dump. Haul a winter's wealth of salt and ash. Crime the four-stroke, mow the grass. She lifts a 50-pound spent battery into her car, hoping the neighbors don't mind charging it up, which they do gladly. Can't handle it, she hisses, ass. Further proof, he's never known her and won't. They go the way of the forest. Further proof, he's never known her and won't. Lies in lone footprints along the snowy front walk. This is a month after the storm, and bulk as he does, he must pack and leave and rant in a long letter he leaves behind. Don't do this. Is it the footprints melodrama that irks the most, or that again, he didn't shovel the walk? She's been away on business, time spent mostly obsessing over the looming date, and there he goes. Tracks heading west. The letter, fodder for the wood stove. But before all this, the final failed tests. Bow break 
under a homegrown weight. The storm takes out the poplars and sweet pine grove. And a small cabin built there of clay and bottles made. The storm takes out the poplars and sweet pine grove that many cathedral pines were twice they found bear scab, that verdant slice of heaven where she sat and wove a dream of a little cabin, then dove headlong into planning until the price set her back to thinking it would be nice someday. And now, Again, as if to prove to her she's wrong to kill this marriage, he wags a finger at the woods. You'll never have it now. It's an impotent threat, last breath of the silent storm that tears a marriage to rags and leaves a couple wondering what hit them. It sweeps in ruin and it comes by stealth. My name is Amy Hoffman, and I teach fiction and creative nonfiction here at the Solstice Low Residency MFA program at LaSalle University. I'm very happy to introduce Laura Williams McCaffrey, even though in a lot of ways, I'm absolutely the worst person to do this. I don't read fantasy, and I didn't even read young adult fiction when I was a young adult. <laughs> And this is what Laura writes, fantasy novels for young adults. But I have to tell you, Laura's work is completely captivating, even for me. Hearing her read, I immediately fall in love with her protagonists and become totally engrossed in what they are doing and what's happening to them. That they may be living in a world quite different from the one I inhabit doesn't matter like I think it would because they, their relationships and their environment are so fully realized. In an interview, Laura explains of her choice of genre. A major theme in fantasy literature is the character who usually because of some highly visible trait is not accepted by his or her community. Often, this trait ensures the character won't ever be entirely accepted. She adds, this kind of character, like this kind of person, intrigues me. Me too. As a lesbian, as a Jew, as an artist, as a dork, well, as many things that have always put me outside of the mainstream, Laura's interest in these characters, her empathy and understanding, draws me into her story. In addition to being an awesome writer, Laura is a teacher of children and young people, as well as of adults. She believes in spreading the word and creating a world right here and now where those unacceptable kids will feel completely at home and loved. She worked as a school librarian, and for many years has taught writing and literature at the Pashem School, an alternative school in her home state of Vermont. Laura also teaches young adult and adult fiction here at Solstice, as you know. And I just have to say one thing about that. Laura has the best hair <laughs> of anyone on the Solstice faculty. <laughs> and there's a lot of competition. <laughs> Please welcome Laura Williams. Thank you, Amy. That was so, I know, I was so 
Sorry, hair store. Um, <laughs> about all of it. Um, and I'm really pleased to be reading you here with this group of people. It's always such an honor. Although passing me cry like right at the start. <laughs> um, I'm thankful I didn't have a terrible divorce, so I wouldn't stop crying during that much. <laughs> Um, okay, I'm, I'm actually going to kind of change the tone. I was trying to decide whether, um, which mode I would be in. I tend to write in two modes, either angst or earnest, um, kind of angsty, creepy YA or earnest, whimsical, younger, for younger people. I'm, I decided on the, the latter. Um, this is from a young middle grade that is looking for a home right now. And, um, so that means for like fourth, fifth, sixth grade readers, third, fourth, fifth. Um, it's not right at the start. The only things you really need to know are that there are two storylines. There's Sam, who lives in the world that we live in. She lives in Vermont. And she and her dad kind of lost their home. So they've been living with their aunt in the next town over. And the town she comes from um, is kind of a quarter town, and that's where she felt more comfortable. And this is a busier town where people have more income, and she doesn't feel very welcome at school. Um, there are also these little people, borrower-esque kind of people. That's the second storyline. And she has had an encounter with one of these people. They're going searching for them and has taken a picture that she wants to show her friend Eric without showing other people. Eric's kind of a new maybe friend. <clears throat> At morning meeting, lots of kids had lots of reflections. Sam had a hard time sitting and listening. She spooned ways to talk to Eric. Eric sat next to her, crisscross applesauce. He was listening to Miss Day. He always listened to the teacher. But his forehead was scrunched. He probably was also thinking about ways they could talk. They'd have to get farther away from the bracelets. The bracelets is what she calls kind of this group of meaner girls. One of them, Olivia, was sitting next to Eric. Next to her sat Genevieve and then Sloan. Next to Sloan sat Tavia, which was strange because Tavia was in Mr. Harper's class, not Miss Day's. Sam didn't really know Tavia, but Tavia seemed nicer than the bracelets, even though she was on their soccer team. At recess, she wasn't mean if kids weren't good at the games everyone was playing. Tavia was the only black kid in fifth grade, but unlike at Sam's old school, there were other kids who weren't white in fifth grade, like maybe Eric. It seemed rude to ask. All right, said Miss Day. Next up, science investigations project. We're going to work in small groups of at least two and no more than four. This time you get to choose your group partners. Sam looked at Eric and Eric looked at Sam. Yes. Other kids around the room were cheering. The three bracelets linked arms, and then Sloan put her arm around Tavia's arm. And Tavia laughed and bent away, saying, your elbow is tickling me. Miss Day gave directions, and Sam tried to listen, but she really couldn't concentrate. She looked for a good spot where she could sit with Eric, a spot where other kids wouldn't hear them. Genevieve, the tall bracelet with the short dark hair, said to Tavia, I love the braids. Tavia said, thanks? but like a question, as if she thought Genevieve might be kidding. Miss Day was finally done. Sam hadn't really heard what the project was. As Eric turned toward Sam, Sam pointed toward the end of the rug, which was farish from the other groups. Eric and Sam started scooching backward toward the end of the rug. In front of them, Sloan, in front of them, Sloan reached over to Tavia and stroked her braids. Your hair is the best. I wish I had it. Tavia leaned away. I keep saying, can you not do that? Sloan reached out and stroked Tavia's braid again, which was creepy. Tavia had just said, stop. But it's so beautiful. Tavia stood up. Sloan said in her direction, what? Tavia waved at Eric, and Eric waved back, saying to Sam, Tavia's in robotics with me. She draws very accurate designs. Do you know why she's in our class today? Sam shook her head. Tavia was walking toward them, and Sam wanted to say, wait, no, but she couldn't do that. Then Tavia would be left out of a group. That had happened to Sam over and over since she came to this school. 
and it always felt rotten. Sloan said, what's wrong with her? Tavia took a short step, as if the question had pinged against her like a stone. Olivia said to Sloan, I wouldn't want you patting my hair. Sloan said, I was just saying I liked it. Sorry. She didn't sound sorry at all. Ignoring her, Tavia sat down next to Eric. She was holding a big black book with lots of pages. Some of the pages had paper clips or sticky notes sticking out. Hi, DC, she said, she said to Eric. Hi, um, sorry, she said to Sam, I don't know your name. But since you're friends with DC, I figured you'd be okay. DC, Sam realized, meant Diaz Cody, which is Eric's last name. Um, she wasn't sure what Tavia meant by okay, but it felt good to be okay. I'm Sam. Are you switching to Miss Day's class? Definitely. Mr. Harper always calls me Tavia instead of Tavia, even though I've been in his class for weeks and weeks, and he gets mad when I say it's Tavia. I told him Tavia, short for Octavia, like Octavia Butler, who is my mom's favorite writer, but I can't read her books yet because they're too scary. And Mr. Harper didn't even know who Octavia Butler was, so I said he should look her up because she's very famous. And then he made me stand for recess for being rude, but it's very rude of him to not get my name right when I've been in his class for weeks. He never apologizes to me. Tavia sounded like this didn't bother her, but Sam thought it did. Her eyes were very bright, like people's eyes sometimes get when they're stopping themselves from crying. Miss Day isn't like that, Sam promised. Miss Day likes Star Trek too, Eric said to Tavia. Then he said to Sam, Tavia loves Star Trek. You know that old space show? Love, love Star Trek, said Tavia. I'm a nerd. Actually, my mom would say blurred, a black girl nerd, like Sheree and Black Panther. I wanted to watch the new Star Treks, but my mom won't let me because they're too grown up. Not until I'm 13. They must be pretty grown up. Sam almost said, you like Star Trek? And then she realized saying that to Tavia because she was black was like kids saying to her, you want to be a mechanic because she was a girl or kids acting like Eric had to clean up after them because of his part Spanish last name. Assumptions and stereotypes, Miss Day would say. Sam said, Sherry is my favorite too. This is a better class for words, said Eric, even though he gestured with his thumb toward Trev, who is friends with the bracelets, the main girls. Tavia wrinkled her nose. So did Eric. So did Sam. Then they all laughed. Miss Day called, are you three working? Definitely, Eric called back. As Tavia opened her notebook, flicking, flipping past lots of pages with drawings and words. Some pages had scraps of paper with drawings taped or pasted to them. Tavia said, do you have an idea for this science project already? Or do we need to brainstorm? Um, Sam hadn't really been paying attention when Miss Day talked about the science project, but she didn't want to say that. Also, now she wouldn't be able to talk to Eric about the picture, because they were the little people, while well, they worked, and they had to talk. Eric leaned forward. He looked at Tavia, and then at Sam, and then back at Tavia. My idea is about Sam's aunt's farm, Mrs. Pelletier's farm. Sam stared at him. Did he need a project about the TV person? Tavia leaned over, crossed her leg, uh, leaned over her crossed legs in her book. She whispered, You mean where people see those lights, those strange lights? Have you seen them? My hypothesis is they're aliens or something aliens left behind. Aliens. The TV person looked more like what Sam had always thought what a fairy would look like than an alien, but no one really knew what aliens or fairies looked like. So, aliens, Eric whispered, smiling. I thought you only liked space shows, as far as I mean. I didn't know you were interested in paranormal activity. We could have, been, we could have talked about paranormal investigation a long time ago. Paranormal investigation, TV whispered, sounding excited. Eric whispered, explaining about the lights and about wanting to be a paranormal investigator. Tavia kept nodding like, yes, yes, yes. Knowing about the picture of the teeny person made Sam feel like she had a bubble inside her, the kind made with bubble stuff that floats and is full of rainbows. Sam leaned forward. They were a little circle of three. Yes, 
what she was the what of Sarah and Tavia. Sam looked both ways. All the other kids were talking and writing in their groups. Miss Day was talking with Treb's group with her hands on her hips, which usually meant she was annoyed. So no one was paying attention to Sam, Tavia, and Aaron. Sam whispered very quietly, I have a picture. What? Whispered Eric in a loud whisper. Shh, hushed Tavia. Sam explained about the picture. Tavia and Eric listened so hard that they barely blinked. Somehow saying it out loud made the picture and the teen person feel a lot more real. Oh my goodness, said Tavia. Evidence, whispered Eric. Sam whispered, I also found out that the bulldozer is coming soon in a week and a half. Bulldozer? Bulldozer, asked Tavia. Wait, rewind. What bulldozer? Ms. Pelletier is building a cabin in the forest, Eric explained. As he went out about the magic forest and the bulldozer, Sam realized Eric and Tavia didn't know that the cabin now was supposed to maybe her house, her cabin, in Lyon, not west, and that she would stay here. This seemed a really important thing to say, but somehow she sat there not saying it. Oh, turned the wrong way, sorry. Then she opened her mouth, but what came out was, I left a message in the tree roots for a meeting today after school. Tavia clasped her hands together and Eric whispered, this fits with my science investigation plan. We could do a bird counting project and we could go out to count birds and non forest We'll do our assignment for the project, but at the same time, we can investigate. He raised his eyebrows, and Sam knew he meant investigate the team person and the lights. My mom and dad, especially my dad, won't let me go to friends' houses after school or soccer practice because homework. But if this is homework, I bet I could. Oh, also it's Friday. So that should be all right with my dad, said Tavia. She glanced over her shoulder at Miss Day. We also should talk about the project we'll do for class. So we have a plan if Miss Day comes to check our work. Deal, said Eric. Deal, said Sam. Um, I also have a friend from West, Ellen, and we are super secret sleuths. I was thinking I could show her the picture and tell her about the forest and about the cabin, about dad on you stay, but that part made Sam's inside still shaken up like a snow globe, cold snow swirling. If telling Ellen is all right with both of you, she has really good ideas and she's a really good detective. Tavia and Eric looked at each other and then Tavia pointed her pencil at Sam. If she's nice, like okay, and not, she pointed with her thumb toward the bracelets, hair grabby and always disrespecting people while pretending she's actually being nice. And if she knows about teamwork, Eric said, and if she's good at collecting data. Sam was already nodding in her head. She's nice for real, and she's a good teammate, and she's good at collecting data. After saying all this, though, Sam had that shaken up feeling again. Ellen hadn't sent answered her messages in weeks. That hadn't actually been very nice. And at West, they hadn't had any teachers like Miss Day who talked about assumptions and stereotypes. Would Ellen make assumptions about Tavia and Eric? I'll talk to her. I'll talk to her about everything so she understands. Today, it'll be us three if all our parents love us. One of the bracelets, Genevieve, called Tavia. Tavia scooted a little farther from the bracelets and closer to Eric and Sam. So one of her knees touched Eric's and one touched Sam's. She said, my parents will let me come over, I bet. Mind you, said Eric. She can't wait, said Tavia. No one had said that about coming over to Sam since she couldn't remember when. Me either, I can't wait. She noticed Miss Day coming across the room, walking in their direction. Oh, Miss Day's coming. Eric, plan. I'll draw it out, whispered Tavia, or I'll make a map. Sam whispered, I'll write the important notes about the forest and the birds, like uh, like the rookery where the, where the crows live. You haven't even been in plan yet, whispered Eric. I'll speed talk. They leaned into their circle and they started. <laughs> Thank you everyone for being here. Thank you for the people in the virtual space as well. And uh, don't forget to uh, check the 
book table, um, purchase books from our fabulous readers. And thank you again to Kathy Rubico, Meg Hardy, and Laura Williams McCaffrey for their wonderful readings.